Good afternoon. Thanks to all of you for coming out. It's a great way to spend a rainy afternoon. Um, <clears throat> Professor Richard E. Miller's presentation will be a multimedia presentation, so that in itself should be great fun. Um, I did want to uh, thank a few people before we get started, and uh, the sponsorship for this this afternoon is the uh, From Fire to iPhone, the Technological Human Theme from Arts and Sciences. And Dean Bob Frank from Arts and Sciences is here. Um, he's supported um, this presentation and this talk, and thank you very much. Um, also, I want to say thank you to um, my colleagues who were trying to make this theme uh, something exciting um, and interesting to um, students and colleagues alike on campus. And just a brief thank you to the English department who is supporting the reception um, afterwards. So there will be um, some fun stuff once we're done and you head out, head out the doors. Um, <clears throat> so Dr. Miller comes to us from Rutgers University where he is professor of English and visiting professor in the doctoral program in social work. As these two positions he inhabits suggest, his interests are wide-ranging, and he teaches and publishes in writing and literacy studies, new media, digital humanities, uh, what he calls the business of higher education, and apocalyptical literature of the 21st century. He's uh, published in all of the major journals in the field, uh, Jack, College English. Um, he's got a piece coming out in Pedagogy, uh, that some of you are, are reading currently. Um, the exigency, I'm going to quote him here, is the exigency for most of his work, as he says himself, is a desire to, quote, develop a philosophy of consciousness that promotes transformative teaching and writing practices. And toward those goals that he has, as I've already mentioned, he's done a lot of publication in the fields in the journal. He also has two monographs. Um, one, As If Learning Mattered, Reforming Higher Education, published by Cornell University Press, and Writing at the End of the World, published by the University of Pittsburgh Press. Um, Writing at the End of the World is one of my favorite books. I think it's extraordinarily powerful, um, moving, and important. I urge you to read it. Um, <clears throat> he's currently co-writing a new project called Habits of the Creative Mind, which is a guide designed to help writers practice being curious in the age of information overload. Seems like a really important project. That will be out in 2015, uh, Bedford St. Martin Press. For the last five years, though, he's been publishing exclusively on his website, Text to Cloud, that's Text to Cloud, um, and it's a site he calls an experiment in public learning. You can find a fascinating assortment of, of scholarly thought um, on the website. You've got writing and memory. Uh, there's a, a piece on the cyber spying that led to the death of Tyler Clemente. Also, uh, something I've been uh, preoccupying myself with when I'm having a bad day is the graphic novel he's working on in that space. It is a uh, hoot. Uh, it follows the misadventures of Professor Pawn, erstwhile member of the Department of Exlification. It's great. You should check it out. <clears throat> Professor Miller has given over 100 invited talks. In his most recent talks have focused, as he will here today, on privacy and how digital technology is transforming literacy, higher education, teaching and learning, and our lives. Professor Miller? Good afternoon. Thank you for that beautiful introduction, and thank you for inviting me to speak. Now, I'm afraid I got two mics on here, so I guess I'll make that one go away. Oops, that's worse. With technological errors, since uh, we're going to be talking about technology, and the key thing to understand about it is that it always never works. Okay. Um, but it's an honor to be here today. It's an honor to be involved in this effort to launch a theme-based uh, structure for general education. Uh, I'm a firm believer in general education. Um, I went to a school that had uh, no electives and was devoted to gen ed for all four years. 
Um, I, uh, you're probably going to see it, that this talk is in some ways a subtle argument for the necessity of focusing on general education as a response to the age of information. Um, this is an entirely new talk for me, so I do expect some of the slides just not to work at certain times. Um, but I really look forward to your feedback. It's also the case that when I give a talk, I don't mind at all being interrupted in the middle of it. So if I say something that's not clear or you feel the need to comment on, just jump in, okay? Uh, all I do ask is, um, uh, I'm not going to uh, insert the Google rules. Google rules are that uh, now for meetings, even at Google, they realize that their employees won't pay attention if they have their electronic devices open. So when they have uh, board meetings, everybody has to close their laptops and turn their cell phones over so they'll actually be in the room. Um, I won't do that today, in part because uh, there is a theory that if you give a talk and no one tweets about it, you didn't actually give it. <laughs> um, okay. Um, but Sherry uh, mentioned to you, uh, my overriding interest is in uh, apocalyptic thinking and um, the Internet's influence on higher education has driven many people to imagine that we're at the edge of an apocalypse. So I'm going to talk through um, how the digital transformation is redefining the very nature of privacy today. Um, and then I will end with a, a gesture towards the implications that has for those of us who are teachers. Um, the end of privacy, what does it look like? It might look like this. This is an image that's only available on the web in this form, that is blurred. Any of you know what it is? This is a screenshot of some of the files that are available as a result of the snapping, which happened a few days ago. A leak of 90,000, between 90,000 and 200,000 images from Snapchat. Uh, they have to be blurred because the overwhelming population of users of Snapchat are under 18. And thus the distribution of these images uh, if you download them to your machine, constitutes trading in child pornography. Now, um, those of you who know what Snapchat is will forgive me this moment where I explain it to people who don't. Okay. Um, say I have a picture, and I want to send it to a friend of mine, but I don't want my friend to keep it. I just want to send it to my friend, and he has it for a brief amount of time. I type something on it. This is what you'd be enjoying if you joined me for dinner. So I take my phone, and I call up the image, and I Snapchat it, and it goes out to the cloud. Then it lands on my friend's phone, and when he opens it, you set a timer between uh, one second and 10 seconds uh, for the amount of time your image lasts, and then it disappears. So uh, this has become a very fun way for young people to correspond. Uh, both of my kids use Snapchat, my eldest uh, more than my youngest, but uh, you become a human emoticon, you make weird faces and send them to your friends and just go Bleh! and then they open it and then it's like, there it is and then it's gone. And, um, <laughs> so it's a way of pranking people and, uh, um, but you can imagine other uses for it. Um, but the mystery is, uh, as the icon for Snapchat shows, the icon's a ghost. The, the, the image is not supposed to exist anymore on your machine or on your friend's machine. So how is it possible that uh, these images were captured and made available? 
Does anybody know how this worked? Yeah. Snapchat does have a server, but the server was not hacked. And, and Snapchat's position is they, they assure you that they do not keep the images. Yeah. Yeah, that's called the NSA, and I'll be <laughs> and I, and I'll be talking about them shortly. Okay. <laughs> yep. They absolutely can. In seven seconds, you could save your image, but think that would mean the images were distributed all over the place. So this is the funny thing about this story, is that you can get this app called. Snapsaved dot, uh, from snapsaved.com. This is their logo, and the logo tells you everything, right? So this is really creepy, I think. Um, this is uh, the sign-in page for the former company, snapsaved.com. Um, and they proudly tell you right away, can the sender see that I am saving the snaps? No. So, we go back, and here's my phone, and I send my image to Snapchat, and I think it's gone, but the truth is, it's there. Now, so what? It's just a picture of a skyline and a goofy statement on it. Um, why might that be a problem? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that might be the succinct answer, but you know, uh, we also know uh, adults do the same thing with their uh, electronic equipment. But um, teens might send pictures um, of their bodies. I went on Facebook to ask uh, my, my friends in the friend community if there was any non-creepy reason to get this app. That is an app where your friends would Snapchat you and they wouldn't know you were keeping it. Um, and nobody could tell me a non-creepy uh, reason for doing this. Um, but I was also informed by someone my age that his kids used it and uh, they sent uh, pictures of each other's experiences in the bathroom. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's people doing what they do. They're jokes, you know? Send somebody a joke, like, oh, I got a picture, oh my god. Okay. So, 200,000 images. Um, uh, there are about 4,000 screen names that were released in the database. Um, so the assumption is that it will be possible to uh, link these images to actual individuals. So we might say this is what the end of privacy looks like. These are the files that are available if you uh, go out and search for the snapping. Um, and uh, they have, um, as I said, videos out there. Um, and here's one uh, user from uh, uh, Reddit with the name Stubbly Prawn. Um, uh, no relation to Professor Pawn, I will say. Um, and, but this uh, person uh, says, I, uh, I highly suggest that you don't download this material. I deleted it as soon as I saw how much CP there is on it, child porn. Don't be part of the snapping, don't seed it, don't share it, just get rid of it. Okay, so that's one thing the end of privacy might look like. You think you're sharing something with your friend and it's a joke, but your friend's keeping it and then somebody hacks in and has access to those images. So one thing the end of privacy means and that you should imagine is that you lose control of your digital records, your memories, your correspondence. Why snapping? 
Why not snap gate? Okay. We had fan gate last night. Did you hear about this? In the Florida debate for governor, uh, uh, Chris used a fan, and Rick Scott got very upset about it, and so it's now traveling the web as fan gate. Uh, so the debate didn't take place for seven minutes because Rick Scott refused to come on stage because Chris had a little fan. Um, but as an English person, I'm interested. That immediately became fan gate. It did not become the fanning. Okay. So why snapping? Does anybody know the origin? Yes, sir. Yes. Often, yes. Excellent answer. Okay, and this will be, uh, now I can reverse it and say uh, the older people in the room can uh, forgive me for explaining this for a moment. Uh, that this goes back to Watergate um, when uh, the uh, Republicans in power uh, had uh, operatives break into the Democratic National Commission. Uh, National Committee's office in Watergate uh, to steal records as part of um, uh, Richard Nixon's re-election campaign. That, and this will become very important shortly, and this is why I bring it up, eventually uh, the exploration of the Watergate trials um, revealed the fact that that was not the first time uh, the Republicans had, under Nixon, the Republicans who were um, responding to the president's charges, uh, invaded the privacy of a, a citizen. Uh, they also broke into uh, the office of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist, and that's the significance of this file cabinet, uh, which you can now see if you go to D.C., this file cabinet is in the Smithsonian. So think about that, okay? They wanted to discredit Ellsberg, who had uh, published the Pentagon Papers. And by the way, do you, do you know how he did that? What technology he used to get the Pentagon Papers out of the Pentagon and to the Washington Post? Yeah. He used a briefcase, but yes, so there, there was that high-tech device. Okay, and then he took the briefcase to Kinko's, exactly, a Xerox store, <laughs> and he stood in Cambridge for days Xeroxing the Pentagon Papers. Okay, this is very important. That's what it meant to uh, be a whistleblower before the age of digital technology. So this file cabinet is also a physical manifestation of what privacy used to look like. If you want to discredit someone, you find their psychiatrist, you break in with a crowbar, and you go in and you try and find the files that are going to explain that Ellsberg is actually has psychically deranged. Um, as it turns out, the theft uh, was unsuccessful. Um, nonetheless, the uh, burglars all went out for champagne anyway. Okay, so why snapping and not Snapgate? As you've said, it's not political. Happening is a fortuitous, spontaneous event. But there's also this. Um, which there may not be anybody in the room young enough to have uh, known this term technically. Uh, but this was the name online among the users of 4chan and Anonymous, uh, the ones who released all of the, uh, their four iterations of naked photos of uh, famous movie actresses. And this was called the fappening. Fappening being 
a computer geek term for There you go, thank you. Yes, that is the term. So uh, it's onomatopoeic, if you will. Uh, he said for masturbation, okay? Yes. <laughs> if you'd like me to say it again later in the talk, I'll be happy to. <laughs> so, uh, but this tells you about the political motivation for this invasion of uh, of privacy? Absolutely not. This was for uh, self-pleasuring, right? And the amount of work that went into the artistry of doing this, right? So they represented it. Some people just made up fake movie representations, like the fappening with uh, the women whose bodies were exposed. Um, uh, one of the uh, more trenchant analyses of this is the great celebrity naked photo leak, leak of 2014 is meant to remind women of their place. Don't get too high and mighty, ladies. Don't step out of line. Don't do anything to upset or disappoint men who feel entitled to your time, your bodies, affection, or attention. Your bared body can always be used as a weapon against you. Your bared body can always be used to shame and humiliate you. Your bared body is at once desired and loathed. So the end of privacy means you lose control of determining who gets to see your body. Uh, so this was a speech uh, Emma Watson gave uh, uh, less than a month ago at the UN. She's a goodwill ambassador, and she was introducing her, uh, the UN campaign, He for She, trying to enlist men in the activity of supporting gender equality. Uh, the statement she's made there is hardly radical, um, and in fact, uh, she's been roundly criticized in the feminist community. Um, for not going far enough. Um, it's also striking how nervous she is, right, for someone who's such a performed, uh, successful actress. Um, but uh, by that evening, uh, this appeared on the web. A story breaks in Fox Weekly uh, saying that 4chan is going to release nude pictures of Emma Watson. Did you hear about this? Most of you heard about it, right? Um, so a striking moment, right, where a woman makes a public statement saying that uh, women deserve to be treated the same way as men, and the response is that this anonymous community uh, that hangs out at the website 4chan is going to uh, do exactly what you would expect in a misogynistic society. They're going to expose the women's, woman's naked body to the world. Um, a website started immediately called Emma Watson, your next .com, and it had a countdown ticker on it. 
and that little uh, heart-shaped uh, icon in the bottom is one of the icons for 4chan. Uh, and it, it says, never forget the biggest to come thus far. And so over the next couple of days, the counter counted down. The, it, at some point, it changed its uh, message to, we will launch earlier, tune in, to sort of get you hungry to see it first before everybody else did. And then when the moment hit to release the promised images of Emma Watson, what came up instead was a big surprise. It was a logo that said, shut down 4chan. Emma, uh, Emma, you are next .com has reached over 48 million visitors, 7 million Facebook shares, likes, and 3 million Twitter mentions worldwide. So it seems like the Emma Watson, you're next, was actually a move to draw people's attention to this trading economy in female bodies and use it to shut down a meeting place where people trade in high-grade porn. Then the site sent you to, uh, it told you spread the word, join us as we shut down 4chan and prevent more private pictures from being leaked. None of these women deserve this and together we can make a change. Don't often see this kind of bold statement about gender equality coming through the internet. If you've been following the cancellation of the talk at Utah State last night uh, by the uh, woman in the gaming industry, you know that the usual response is texting, tweeting, that we're going to kill you, rape you, and murder everybody that you know. So this seems like a moment for optimism, like somebody gamed the system and got everybody to watch, thinking they were going to see Emma Watson, but instead it's a protest. Uh, the page, uh, visitors to the page were then redirected to a site called Rantic Marketing, and where there was a letter to D uh, Barack Obama that you could click and send to him. It says, we've been hired by celebrity publicists to bring this disgusting issue to attention goes on saying, we want to get one step closer to closing down 4chan. Completely awesome, right? Somebody knows the next step. It's a hoax. The first part was a hoax. They didn't have pictures of Emma Watson. The second part's a hoax. They were not hired by any celebrity publicists, they weren't acting on Emma Watson's behalf, they weren't interested in closing down 4chan. The magazine that broke the story about the photos on Emma Watson is a fake magazine run by these people. And so they created all of these hits on a series of their websites but what's not clear is, to what purpose? To what end? What's the politics of doing a hoax within a hoax within a hoax? So the end of privacy might mean the end of introspection, the end of being thoughtful, existing only in a parodic discourse. The Pew uh, Charitable Trust has a study of uh, the internet's effect on um, uh, end users in America. They've been doing it for, since the start of the internet. Uh, they uh, represent themselves as being neutral. They're not trying to make an argument one way or another about technology or about the internet. 
uh, whether it's good or bad. They're just trying to present information for us to use. But the most recent report on the internet is called The Spiral of Silence. And the argument of the report is that the more you use social media, the less likely you're to disagree with people either online or face to face. So that there's a reciprocal experience of uh, resisting confrontation in both the virtual realm and the real realm. Um, so they decided to ask uh, people in this latest uh, questionnaire about the uh, government's uh, program to uh, have access to all of your communication in the war on terror. Um, and this was the result of people's, uh, to that, 13% strongly favor the policy of having access to all communication, 24 somewhat, 22 somewhat oppose, so forth. 10% didn't know or didn't respond. So the next question is, well, how likely would you be to uh, talk about the issue of the government surveillance programs if they came up in a variety of locations? A, com a community meeting, at work, at a restaurant with friends, at family dinner, and then on Facebook. So this is just one example of how the numbers fall off. Um, uh, 39 people very willing to talk about uh, the surveillance program at a family dinner. That drops to 15% on Facebook. It's also interesting to me at the other end of the scale, if 12% of the people who don't know, um, I'm sorry, are very unwilling to speak at a family dinner, um, that group grows to 34% online. So they're even more unwilling to talk about it online than they are in person. So the argument of this study is that the effect of uh, social media is that it produces a spiral of silence around difficult issues. That it produces a world of communication where people either agree or they remain silent. So we've looked at examples of how um, the hacker community is able to access uh, personal information about both famous people and common everyday people and distribute it without their permission and virtually without consequence. The opposite side of the uh, discussion is the NSA. The National Security Agency, the Central Security Service, I have to say, I, after all the reading I've been doing on this, I just assumed that as soon as I visited this page, the NSA opened a file on me. Um, uh, so you can visit the um, official page of the NSA and it, uh, its explanation of its policies and procedures. Um, but the reason why we know so much about the NSA is because of another hacker. Um, insider, whistleblower, some, some would say traitor, some would say hero. Um, but the point is we know about the NSA's activities uh, not because our government disclosed this to us, not because our elected officials disclosed this to us, but because uh, Edward Snowden uh, made this information available to uh, journalists. He felt that the NSA's behavior uh, marked a fundamental change in uh, the nation's relationship to the privacy of its citizens and that he could not uh, any further participate in that. 
he was originally going to uh, do his leak uh, in 2008, but he decided to hold off because he uh, thought that Obama was going to change things. Uh, when he discovered that, in fact, Ob uh, Obama would uh, increase the reach and range of NSA beyond what George Bush had done, he realized that he had to go ahead and leak it um, under Obama. Now, um, because of Edward Snowden, we know that the NSA has a PRISM program and that they've collected data from Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, Facebook, AOL, Skype, YouTube, Apple. Is there anybody in this room who hasn't used one of those? It's not possible. Not today. Okay. Um, uh, part of the leak uh, that he did, he released uh, a slideshow uh, that was used by the NSA to uh, introduce people uh, within the uh, security community to what the PRISM program does. Here are the current providers, and what the PRISM program gives you is email, chat, videos, photos, stored data, VIOP, file transfers, video conferencing, everything. Everything. Now these, we were talking about this uh, just before we came in and the, having a visual design sense. Uh, there's a, this is a side note, but it's a funny thing about one response to these slides. In the online community, uh, people who are in the design business look at these things and that one of the things that strikes them is how terribly designed they are. Right? This is state of the art nation trying to communicate information visually and it looks like it was done by maybe a freshman. So some people have said, oh, let me, you know, even though I totally disagree with the politics, let me redesign it for you so that it's more effective at conveying uh, this systematic invasion, warrantless invasion of the privacy of American citizens. Um, because of uh, Snowden's release, we know that 90% of the data collected from these sources is from unintended targets. They cast an enormous net and they collect whatever is in the net. We know um, as a result of his release and the slides that he's released that the ultimate goal of the security community is to be able to sniff all information that moves on the internet, know it, collect it, process it, exploit it, and partner it. All information, globally. How do they do that? The leak is so um, detailed that he even has a screenshot of uh, a handwritten uh, diagram of, of how the NSA has accomplished this. You see here that on the one side, the public internet, all of us are using our machines, and then they, they go into SSL, the secure locking system that's supposed to encrypt it. But then it goes through the central server for Google, and if you look at the bottom there, it has a little smiley face from uh, the NSA because they come in at that point in the communication and they remove the encryption and they can read absolutely everything in real time. They've developed a program called X Key Score that allows for real time collection of data as it is produced at the keyboard. I thought the thing in uh, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo was just made up. It's based on this idea that you could actually be inside someone's computer and see them typing as they're typing. Uh, Snowden's uh, assertion is that he can do that for anybody in the world. All he needs is their email address. 
NSA's been in Second Life and World of Warcraft, spying. Uh, and of course, NSA, as they pull in all of this information, has been finding information that has nothing to do with terrorism whatsoever. But since they have access to all your private records, sometimes they stumble across something that is completely unrelated in any sort of necessary sense, like an intimate photo or a video. And he says, they turn around, they share it with their friends, and sooner or later, this person's whole life has been seen by all of those other people. The end of privacy means the government is exercising its power to record your every digital communication without your knowledge. This is probably the only issue in the past four years that has had bipartisan support. It came, uh, there was a bill to regulate the NSA's be behavior in the House. It came within seven votes of passing, and it was, uh, the supporters were half Republican and half Democrats. Uh, there is a sense that uh, your right to privacy is actually not a party-based issue, but a constitutional right. I'm interested in this for a lot of reasons, but as a teacher, I'm interested in trying to imagine what education can be like without the assumption of privacy, without the assumption that you can make a mistake and it's not going to be recorded and uh, preserved for all time. The possibility that you could meet in a room like this and not be concerned about being recorded, remixed. I'm wondering about the possibility of education when there isn't a possibility for introspection when there isn't a possibility for time offline. So, aside from the content of what is being delivered and whether that is being uh, observed or not, I think we should be talking about, at this point, what should education have to do with the end of privacy? When uh, Ellsberg released the Pentagon Papers. This was a central issue of the time. Uh, now, not so much. Uh, the news about the NSA interests a few people, but it's much more likely uh, that uh, you've seen ice bucket challenges uh, or um, amusing videos about uh, dropping uh, candy into uh, Diet Coke. But the use of the internet as a way to begin to understand how we might communicate about the most important ideas of our time, that we haven't figured out. And I think it's possible that the reason we haven't is because that's not what teenagers do. And if uh, educated people do not devote themselves to spending time online to create an educated culture, we can't actually be surprised that this is the outcome. My uh, suggestion uh, is to point you towards thinking of writing in this new environment as a technology for thinking new thoughts. Before we had information everywhere, writing was treated as a tool for communicating. You learned something, you figured something out, and you communicated it to someone. Because there was a scarcity of information, that was an efficient use of the tool. But writing isn't a tool, it's a technology. It's a set of tools. And it's a way of expanding the human consciousness. If we think of writing as a technology for thinking new thoughts, we can begin to see the difference between teaching writing before the web and teaching now. When I started, teaching composition involved uh, me, books, students, and paper. 
Students wrote papers, they handed them in to me, I commented on them and returned them. And the work of writing was the work of learning how to make better sentences, better paragraphs. Now, what's so overwhelming is that composing in the 21st century is not just text. There's a name for that, or there's a little acronym, TLDR. Right? Too long, didn't read. Okay, so you'll write a long comment on something and somebody will just put TLDR. Okay. It's a reality of how uh, discourse is working. And so the concern I have is for, in the 21st century, for educators to be thinking about composition as being necessarily multimedia composition as being born digital. And this doesn't mean saying you take your Word document and save it as a PDF, okay? <laughs> That's not thinking with this technology. It's letting the technology use you. The problem is even more complicated than this diagram suggests. Because it's not simply that in composing now, we need to be able to work with graphs, video, sound, data, animation, maps, text, and image. It's that each one of these spokes requires that we be able to work with material that is in that form, but we also need to be able to build in those forms ourselves, build our own animations, build our own interactive graphs. Um, build our own online archives. Um, this is necessarily collaborative work. It's a way in which the uh, idea of a theme course that's interdisciplinary um, is, a, is an appropriate curricular response to the challenge of the time. Um, and as a final point, say, in presenting this argument to you, I know that in so doing, th these are the resources I used in creating this multimedia event. Um, all done on this little machine. All done with software that comes with the machine. Um, my goal as a teacher is to uh, strive to teach both faculty and students to come to find an ability to express themselves through this medium with the same level of sophistication and thoughtfulness that we used to demand from text alone. If we don't do that, the web will simply exist as a place where people trade porn and argue in uh, absolute terms about issues that require complexity, sophistication, and nuance. Those are and always have been the trademarks of an educated mind, and it's why higher education is still centrally relevant in the 21st century. Thank you. Absolutely. Yep. Go ahead. I would say that is the standard um, move uh, that an academic makes at this moment. You provide a critique and then you 
say our job is to resist. Um, and so you're absolutely right. That is the move I did not make. Okay, so the question was, I'm sorry, I didn't repeat it. Uh, the question was, uh, and I think it's a very perceptive observation, uh, that uh, the talk focused on the dangers of privacy both from below, from uh, anonymous hackers, and from above, from anonymous uh, employees of the government. And the expectation was that the argument would be moving towards why we need to resist this. But instead, I've turned towards um, uh, the questioner's terms was a, a celebration of hip uh, a new media presentation. Um, I have resisted the move, the automatic move to resistance because um, in one sense, uh, to quote uh, a show that most people will recognize, Resistance is futile. Um, and uh, in a real sense, the nature of where we are uh, culturally is that you, you have one of two options. Um, you either find a way to use this technology to begin to build the world you want to live in, or you recognize that the last place of privacy that remains is your head, and that's as long as you never say anything out loud. Anything you say can be recorded. It can be distributed online. Um, this is the most invasive panoptic technology. It makes Foucault look like an amateur in uh, thinking about what the surveilled society would look like. He never could have imagined that we ourselves would spend $600 to put surveillance devices on ourselves. Okay, he never would have. Okay, um, but that's the nature of where we are. And my concern is that in order to speak powerfully in this moment, we need to figure out how to communicate in the medium of our time. We have moved from paper to the screen. Um, that's not my desire. I grew up with paper. I loved writing books. I loved teaching writing when it was just composing. But that isn't the world anymore. We're living at a time of a total paradigm shift. The nature of uh, higher education is that it's not designed to move quickly. Um, and there's an inherent uh, conservatism and I mean that in a positive sense, conserving culture that is the function of higher education. But that is working at odds with our ability to be a meaningful player in the most in powerful and important issues of our time. Um, and I think we have to figure out how to do it in this medium. Not only in this medium, but this is the way you make contact. Interesting thing about Snowden I just learned, he never graduated from high school. I just found that amazing. Uh, he got a GED, he did a few courses at a community college, and before you know it, he's a head analyst at uh, working first for the CIA, uh, then the NSA, and then a private contractor. Um, so, um, I don't think that that's an accident. You know, when you read his writings, one of the things that strikes me about it is he's an incredibly good writer. And he didn't get that at school. He will tell you that the, one of the reasons why he released all this information was because the internet was where he got his education. And the threat to the freedom of the internet is the threat to the place that made it possible for him to be a thinker. Go ahead. Yes, it's a t-shirt. I'm not. I love the title. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
I, uh, so the question is, uh, if, um, if you have a multimedia assignment and a student hands in a t-shirt as the multimedia, right, it's fabric with images on it, my, my response is, what's the new thought? What did doing this enable you to think that you could not think before you did it? That's where you get the introspection. Uh, absolutely. It, for all of my classes, writing's essential. I don't ever accept anything that doesn't have text in it, um, ever. Um, that's not the kind of teacher, I mean, I'm a writing teacher. Language is the, is the, <laughs> is the vehicle for me. Um, but for me, the question really is to ask at every learning moment, what's the new thought here for you? Okay, what's the new thought? And that's, if you ask seniors at my school, um, and you say to them, uh, you talk to them about TED, uh, the show of great 20-minute lectures, but the, the uh, gimmick for TED is they say, ideas worth sharing. Say, you better graduate with an idea worth sharing. And so, is that t-shirt we're sharing? It's not. It's, we all know what it is, right? It's BS, and they should be called on it. <laughs> Just like, you know, handing in a music video for me is not, you're not doing the work. Okay. Go ahead. We just implemented it at Rutgers. Yes. Yes. I do. Yeah. of privacy in the government, you know, coming down and the, you know, hackers from below, a kind of sense of, of, um, of this sort of, you know, pairing of the corporate and the higher educational, uh, uh, you know, doing some kind of closing down, you know, mm -hmm. in this kind of, uh, you know, work um, and, and, you know, making things template driven and just sort of, you know, yeah. um, harder and harder to do this kind of work yeah. without the resources available, unless you're in one of those departments where. Uh, so the observation is that um, doing this work um, requires resources, uh, time, I would say, first and foremost. You know, I, I do a lot of faculty workshops. You can't figure out how to do this in an afternoon. Um, and uh, my experience of many teaching and learning centers is that it, they do teach this like it's a set of keystrokes rather than a way of thinking. Um, so you need resources, you need time, you need access to these machines. Your students need access to the same machines. Um, and this is happening at a time when universities are looking at bottom line, guaranteed enrollments, non-experimental classes. Um, uh, so I didn't name another pincher on education, which is uh, the managerial uh, uh, domination of higher education. Um, uh, I think one of the reasons why I'm no longer in administration, and I spent 20 years in administration, um, 
is uh, precisely because of the power and effect of that managerial model. Um, and it's indifference to learning. Uh, it's sloganeering in, in exchange or instead of actually teaching. Um, so uh, one of the virtues of being tenured is that I can, in fact, experiment. Um, and what I find is that, in fact, part of the idea of college is that you're going to come and have your head blown. And part of what's really depressing, I, just, I have a kid who's just started, and the stories she tells me from the front line are just horrific. Classes with 500 students, everybody's doing crossword puzzles, some guy's mumbling at the front of the room. And these are her, her whole semester. This is her experience of education. Um, and I don't think that's unusual at a big state university. Um, I've also found, but I teach at a big state university, and I found that, in fact, students want to be compelled to think new thoughts. Uh, they have to be put in an environment where they're helped to do that, rather than punished for not being able to. Okay? And so I just would say, I mean, it's a partial answer, but that's all we have at this point. I would say the virtue, the luxury of being a tenured person is that I can experiment. And what I find is students will sign up for a fair deal. Um, and it doesn't have to be, I'm going to teach you how to tech right, because that's not what I teach. I say, I'm going to teach you to think new thoughts. Now, we used to have a different name for that. We called it the life of the mind. Okay? But we were talking at the, uh, before coming about part of the effect of uh, our immersive technological environment, and this is not just on young people, this is on adults as well, is a sense of absolutely living in the present that there isn't a future, that each moment is a moment is a moment is a moment. And you don't have a life of the mind if that's what you experience. Uh, if you read Edward Snowden's work, one of the things you'll find is that this is an incredibly thoughtful guy uh, who's developed his sense of ideals from being online in communities where people are talking about patriotism and what it means to be a citizen. Um, so one way to answer the question is, what do we need to be thinking about in the 21st century at a university is, well, what does it mean to be a citizen anymore? Um, that's, that may not be a question that people in the bottom line are interested in, but that really is our social function, is to help people learn how to be in the room with people they don't agree with. Right? That's part of the separating effect of this social media. And then how do you learn how to communicate with each other aside from yelling at each other? which is the dominant mode of discourse. So it, it doesn't answer the larger structural problems. Um, and I've ended up, uh, when I did my doctoral work on uh, the reform of higher education, I worked very consciously against the great man theory of history, that it was the leader that mattered. And I studied uh, history from below. But now that I've been in the business and I've been locally, if you don't have a good leader at the top, you can't get structural change to happen. Um, and I watched that happen at my own university. Um, so there's something about scale that, in fact, you need to have a leader who's interested in education. And that is harder and harder to come by, uh, the way boards work, the way uh, tuition works. Um, so I think if somebody's going to make the change, it's going to be the people who are protected. And that's people with tenure. Go ahead. Speaking of structural change, I'm wondering if part of the reason there's been so much talk but so little progress on the issue of privacy is that the word itself has become this floating signifier. Mm -hmm. So if you, I'm 23. If you talk to my peers, there's still many of them who make a lot of noise about the NSA and the issues, just like someone in an, in an older generation. But if you probe them about those questions, their underlying concepts of what privacy should be are very different. So I guess my question is, do you think there can be any sort of progress without a significant renegotiation socially of what privacy actually means now? Oh, I think there has to be. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry, repeat the question. Um, 
What about a generational divide about how you define privacy? And I think that's spot on, actually, because one of the difficulties the Academy is facing right now is that there's a generational divide between people who grew up with paper, they grew up with a sense that privacy could be controlled in that sense, versus people who have grown up knowing or ha maybe having experienced, learned the hard way that information can just get stripped away from you. And so there is a, there's a difference at the level of experience, and the desire of an older generation to try and reinstate a previous meaning is a non-starter from the beginning. So for me, uh, if you were to have a theme on it or you were to work on it in the university, privacy would have to be an open question. What is it? What might it continue to be? Um, uh, so, you know, one of the things that I think would be worth asking about is, one way to have privacy is you go off the grid, right? You become Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, okay? And that, you know, that was his goal. He hated technology and he wanted to kill technology. He's called the Unabomber because he wanted to kill universities, okay? Um, so, that's off the grid is one response, and then the response we have to uh, think through if we're going to live together in a society is how do you negotiate that across generational lines? So I think you're spot on. Yeah. One more question. Okay. Maybe if we can be out there and see us, and um, do you think much is being done about this privacy? I mean, like the thing is, I, I've asked some of my peers about like Snowden, and many people just like don't even know what, what about these NSA leaks, and maybe people just don't care mm -hmm. in general. But do you think things are being done about this to like conserve people's privacy? Uh, the question is, uh, if people of a certain age uh, are not interested in Snowden, uh, are other people doing something about it? Um, there, as I say, I mean, I think it was a surprise. It was a surprise to Snowden. It was a surprise to Greenwald. Um, that when this um, uh, legislation came up to restrict the NSA's power, it got 50-50 support across the aisles. I mean, in the past, going back to Bush, I can't remember a bipartisan issue other than the, uni you know, the Leninist support for the war where everybody says I, okay? Um, so this was a moment when, when from both sides people were saying, this is not what it means. You can't be free if your government is taking your information. Okay? And the common response is, if you don't have anything to hide, man, you got nothing to worry about. So um, what, there was a, a Greenwald in his book, which is called No Place to Hide. He gives a fantastic example of this. He says he sits down for the first time with Snowden. They're in Hong Kong. They've gone through incredible measures to meet in private, and they've got a documentarian there who's filming this. The movie just came out uh, two days ago in New York City. Um, and he said they were talking, and then she turned the camera on, and everything changed. The moment you know you're being watched is the moment you stop saying things, and the moment you get your camera face on, okay? so. I think, I think it's a general failure of higher education that we haven't nationally been able to make it clear to young people why it matters that the government has your phone records. Um, so um, there's a little bit being done at the top, but the top is the uh, place that's protected this. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about Watergate. This actually isn't a new thing. It's a continuation of a 40 years process <laughs> of trying to uh, uh, take advantage of American citizens at the government's expense. So um, uh, I think it's not just young people who don't care. In the DSW program where I teach, I've had to show them, they work with people who are suffering, uh, people who are seeing social workers, and I'm trying to make clear to them, you know, We've moved to a healthcare system where your records are all placed online. Have you seen this when you go to the doctor now? They sit down and there's a uniform. Is that private? Is that secure? Is it going to be a good thing when the hackers can get in and find out that you had this disease, 
you came in for this thing, you've got this psychological definition. Um, anything that's online can and will be stolen. Snowden shows that. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.